So uh, today we're going to look at the second half of Romans chapter 5. Uh, so until now, we learned the basics of Christianity, the righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. And yesterday, we learned Romans chapter 5. We le learned the first uh, five verses of Romans chapter 5. And I think the first five verses are very profound, uh, like I mentioned yesterday. Uh, it speaks about peace, joy, uh, the meaning of suffering that we have that is more than just suffering in ourselves, but suffering has a greater purpose in God, the maturity that we gain, and a new hope that we receive, we receive from God. That the hope is not from ourself, but it, it is a hope that we, we receive. Just like faith we receive, hope is something we receive from God. And this is a great blessing, right? If we just hope in ourselves, then, you know, this, this comes out as just, uh, uh, you know, just us and we're limited and we're sinful. But a hope that we, we receive from God is, you know, a great blessing. It's something completely beyond us, right? And we see that, that the hope that we get is a hope from God. So this whole second part of Romans chapter 5 that we are going today, do today, is going to look at a bigger picture of the hope of God. Now we're going to look at more of a historical framework. So if we looked at Romans chapter 1 through 4, and then even the first few verses that we read in Romans chapter 5, until now we've been speaking a lot in terms of a personal framework. But the second part of Romans chapter 5, we're going to look in more of a historical framework as a whole. And so uh, we're going to be able to see that uh, a little bit here. And we're going to see how Paul does that. So let's get into it. Uh, we're going to read, first of all, from Romans chapter 5, from verse 6 through 11. So if you can open up your Bibles or turn to Bible Gateway on your computer and turn to Romans chapter 5, uh, from verse 6 through 11. I'm going to read for you. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God's through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here it's talking about at just the right time. In Greek, this is kairos, when we talk about the time here. Uh, this is distinguishing between chronos time. So kairos, this means a qualitative time. This means a special time. Now, chronos is a quantitative time. This is... Uh, you know, it, it's the same word time, but it really has a meaning that, you know, time that just sort of goes and flows. Uh, but, quali but a qualitative time, the kairos time, that's what Paul's talking about here, a very special time. And what, I mean, what Paul is saying is, is that Jesus Christ coming to this earth, right, from a historical framework, looking at all of history, and the moment that Jesus Christ came to this earth, this wasn't just random. Right? It wasn't just something that just came uh, and, it, and it just happened. Right? It was, there was a purpose. There was a reason behind it. Right? There was a reason of God sending his son. There was a time, a special time, God coming to this earth. So if you look at the situation of the earth at that time, you can, you can really study it and examine this. When I was in college, I, I actually took a, a class on Rome. And when you really look at Rome and how Rome was, you can understand that this was a time that mankind, when you look at its history, and when you look at from the time of Adam up until the time that Jesus came, uh, mankind was at its peak filthiness and depravity. Right? There were uh, abandoned babies and um, there were abandoned babies and people just leaving babies on the streets. And even, uh, you know, the, the Colosseum where they had uh, humans being, you know, people being devoured by animals and they had millions of slaves even. 
And so, you know, when you look at multiple things in Rome, it was completely, completely depraved. And so Rome was at its peak depravity. Sin was piled up. You can see that what Paul is trying to say here is that mankind was completely ungodly. We were enemies of God. We were the opposite of godly. We deny God. We are enemies with him. We hated God. So Rome was at that pre peak depravity. So, you know, you look at Rome and what we've been saying all this time as we look at Romans is this is America. Right? This is America. America, we are the most powerful nation in the world. But, you know, you look really closely at it and you, you know, read the news and you look around us. You know, I, I, I walk around here in San Francisco even. And, you know, there, there's so much sin and so much depravity around. We're sinners and we are God's enemies, right? We're sinners and God's enemies. That is what Paul is saying. You know, we need to know that that is who we are. Right? We are sinners and we're God's enemies. We need to know who we are and we need to know that we deserve in actuality God's wrath and punishment. Right? There is God's wrath and punishment and we deserve it you know, because we're sinners and we're depraved. You know, now some people, they misunderstand this a bit. They say, oh, you know, God, you know, God, the God of love, why does he get angry at me? Why does he punish me? You know, why isn't God nice to me? But, you know, when you look at people who say this and who misunderstand God in this way, and we come to see that this is a very humanistic misunderstanding of God. It's like God is just another person. And so when he has anger at me, when he punishes us in judgment, it comes out of some self-centered anger from God. Like that, like God is just another person and he has self-centered anger just like another person would. But, you know, that's not how we view God, right? What we've been saying all this time, God is above us. He completely transcends us. And not only that, God is holy, righteous, true, and he is the perfect loving one. So, you know, God is perfect. There's nothing wrong with God. It's all us, right? It's all us. We are the sinful ones. And so there is a characteristic of God that we need to know about God's love. God's love means that he also has judgment. God's love also means he has judgment. What this means is that there is conclusive judgment and punishment for our sins. That in love, there is justice. There is this justice. That, that, that love has goodness in it. And so if there is evil, right, which is the opposite of goodness, so if there is evil, then, there, then in that love, there must be justice. There must be judgment for that evil. There must be punishment for sin. So the Bible is very, very clear about that. Judgment for sin always happens. It's inevitable. It's not that judgment can be ignored, right? It's not that judgment can, can just pass by. There needs to be justice for that sin because that is love. In love, there is justice for evil because love is good. Right? And there must be justice for evil. So if there is evil, if there is sin, then in that love, in the God of love, that, that punishment, that justice, that judgment for that sin is inevitable and it can't be ignored. But what is the problem? Right? What is our problem? It's that we're, it's not God. You know, God is perfect. It's us. Our problem is, is that we're depraved sinners and we can't do anything about it. We're enemies of God and we just couldn't stop sinning no matter what we did. So the problem isn't necessarily the punishment and the fact that there is punishment and judgment for the sin. And the problem is, is that we're depraved sinners and we can't stop sinning. And then we, can't also we cannot also take the punishment. We have no way of taking the punishment. We're endlessly, endlessly sinners. And, you know, we have no ability, no way in order to take the punishment. And so that is why God knew this. God knew we were weak, right? That we couldn't stop sinning and we couldn't even take our own punishment. So when the world was completely helpless, when it was depraved and helpless in a way where there was just no way, you know, it was at the peak depravity. At just the right time, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to save us from the judgment of sin. 
the love of God was fully revealed in the person of Jesus. Jesus came in the flesh of mankind. Jesus was a man. Right? Jesus came in the flesh of mankind to save sinful mankind. Right? He came in the sinful flesh of all of us to save us. We who should have bore the sin, the punishment for the sin that we have. We should have faced death for our sin. You know, our sin was piled up so much and there should have been death for that sin. But Jesus Christ took up that punishment, that death for us. He bore the precious cross. He bore the precious cross for the sin of all sin of the whole world, for all people and all time. And he bore the sin for all of us. He shed his blood for us on the hill of Calvary, he took the punishment because we couldn't. God couldn't just shrug off that sin. We were at this peak of depravity. We just had just piled up and piled up and piled up this sin, you know, not being able to, to take the punishment, the justice for that sin. And so it had piled up and payment was necessary. Justice was necessary for that sin. And so Jesus became that punishment, the substitute. You know, he took the punishment for us. He was the substitute for or punishment that we should have taken. And so, you know, this meaning of the cross, you know, when we really look at the meaning of the cross, we meditate on the meaning of the cross, this is something that really has to enter our hearts. You know, I emphasize this over and over again in Romans. You know, how many times have I said this in Romans? Not our heads, it's our hearts, right? And that's what Paul's expressing in this passage, because by the head, intellectually, you know, he says, you know, we can see how a person might die for a righteous, good person, right? I mean, if there is a, a good person, if there is a good reason, right? If, if there is a good reason, I might go and save a, a person, right? I might die for a righteous and good person. But Paul says, there is no reason really to die for an ungodly person, for a com person who's completely depraved, completely the enemy, Right? What reason is there to die for an ungodly person? There is absolutely no reason for that. But, you know, Christ did it. Jesus did it. It wasn't because of the head. There is no reason in the head that can comprehend why Jesus died on the cross. This is something only, only we can know in the heart. And so, you know, Jesus dying for the ungodly is a very special thing. You know, at just the right time. This is a special time, a special quality to it. It's something we can only really know that meaning in the heart. You know, I can explain it this way. I can explain it that way. You know, I've been explaining and explaining through several Bible studies, the, the message of the cross. But, you know, when it comes down to it, the gospel is not in the head. We cannot understand it by, by you know, how can you understand a paradox? Like something completely flipped around, you know, by intellect, by the head. You know, people try to use philosophy and reasoning. You know, to understand the gospel, but you can't. You know, I think even this is why Jesus talked in parables. So if you look at the Bible, Jesus spoke in parables and analogies and metaphors. It's because, you know, it's like telling children a story. So if you have a child and you need to explain something very complicated to them, and then, you know, like, oh, you need to eat your vegetables. Well, you might tell them a story about, you know, why you need to eat your vegetables. My mom, you know, like, you know, eat your carrots because carrots are good for your eyes. You know, you might say something like that. You know, you need to tell a story so that they can understand it very simply, right? And so the gospel, the gospel is that way. You cannot understand it really with your head. I mean, Jesus says, turn the other cheek and don't pay back, right? If someone does something to you, don't pay back that punishment and hit them back. But instead, turn the other cheek. Well, that's incomprehensible by the mind. And so, you know, really, when you look at the grace of Jesus Christ on the cross and what he did on the cross, right, the message of the gospel, the message, the, the actual message on the cross is that he didn't ask for anything. He died for the ungodly ones, not asking for anything. People that didn't deserve it, and he didn't ask for anything back. That is the grace of Jesus Christ on the cross. It's something we can only really know in the heart. You know, how sad is it if we just turn the gospel and understand it you know, intellectually like philosophy? 
you know and and when that happens when people try to do it that way it just sticks in the head and then it becomes dry right the the word of god the gospel the message of god just becomes something dry something i'm analyzing all the time and that's how a lot of people walk in faith they just analyze this situation analyze that situation and they walk just in a very dry way you know looking at their life in faith and following god in a very dry way but that's not the path of God that God wanted for us. And that's not the message of the cross. The message of the cross is warm love for us. It's not dry, but it's a warm, moist love in our hearts. It's a meaning beyond comprehension. It's a meaning in the heart. You know, if by the cold way we would understand the cross, we might just say something like, oh, you know, Jesus, he sent his son. That's what he was supposed to do. It was just the progress of history. That's just what God did for the world. And we might just look at it in a very dry way like that and accept the cross in a very dry way. But how sad is it if we accept Jesus Christ and his sacrifice in, in this cold way without this warm love entering our hearts? You know, there's no meaning. You know, when, when it doesn't enter our hearts, then there's no meaning behind it. You know, it's kind of like sending our young men into the battlefield for war. And, when they, and then many die in that battlefield. And what do we say? Well, they, they, they just died. And we just say, oh, it was meant to be. And it has no meaning behind it. It was just meant to be. That's just how it was. It was fate. I mean, how dry would that be? You know, there was one young student who saw a drunk man on a railroad track. Uh, the train was about to come. And this guy was drunk. And the train was about to hit him. But he pushed that, 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 that drunk man away. And instead of the drunk man dying, this young, young student, this young student who pushed him away, he died instead. And so, you know, this came out in the news and it made everyone think, you know, really, what was the meaning behind it? Now, if the drunk man wakes up the next day and he finds out about this and, you know, he thinks, oh, it was just fate. And he thinks about it in a cold way and just continues drinking. And then, and then he forgets about what happened. You know, how sad is that? You know, of course, this person should re-examine their life, the meaning behind that death, how he survived and how he should live better. It's the same way with us too. The death of Jesus is meaningful. It's not just, you know, we, we, you know, we shouldn't just understand it with our mind as something that should just happen for us. And we just accept it that as it just happens for us like that. You know, it's not just acceptance in the mind. It's really acceptance in the heart that we need, that it's meaningful. When it enters our heart, it becomes meaningful. And we understand why Jesus died for us and how that is meaningful. Now, he is our Lord and our Savior. You know, really, Jesus is more than enough. All our sin, everything about us, he died for. He took the punishment we should have taken. And there was no other way back to God. The whole world, there was no other way back to God. But through Jesus, there was... Yeah, we were able to. There's no other gospel, no other salvation except Jesus. And I wish we can be the ones that truly know this meaning of the cross that Jesus walked. So uh, we'll pause there. I'll let you guys reflect on this for a moment. Um, you know, we've been talking, I think, a lot about the meaning of the cross, uh, more in our heart uh, than our head. You know, having that warm love and understanding it deeply in that way and and, and, and going in faith, you know, with that deep meaning in it. And so what are your thoughts on that? Or what are your thoughts really about, you know, anything in, in this first slide that we read? I think what, as you reflected, I think it, I think what, what comes to me is just the understanding in the heart that is, is, is different than the head that, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I have experiences like that when I listen to messages and I'm listening to message and I'm listening to, um, you know, uh, preaching. And then it doesn't, you know, I, I can't really grasp everything with my head. I can't, you know, really add up everything together. But, you know, something in the heart, which is unexplainable, still comes, you know, deeply inside. It strikes a light into my heart. And, and I think uh, I like the way you, you expressed what your feeling was of, of understanding the cross. Because I think whether it be the word uh, of God as we do Bible study or sermon, or it be, you know, the, the cross, the meaning of the cross in and of itself. Uh, I think that there is definitely something, um, you know, that, that comes without explanation, you know, into the heart. So, amen.
so um, great, uh, great feedback. Uh, let's continue on. And we're gonna look at Romans chapter five from verse 12 through 21. So the whole second half of Romans five here we're gonna look at. Romans chapter five from verse 12 through 21. I'm gonna read it. It said, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. To be sure sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charging us anyone's account where there is no law nevertheless. Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through the one man, how, may, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one act, a one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ or Lord. Uh, so again, uh, we are coming to grips with history's framework here that Paul is bringing out. Really, Paul is saying that there are two different worlds happening here, right? And that we see. So there is the world, one, of, one in Jesus, one of peace and rejoicing in God. But there is this other world. There's this other world that started from the time of Adam. And this other world is a world full of suffering and sin, the wrath of God, broken relationships with him, evil and depravity inside of the world. And so, you know, really, if you look at history and you look at history's framework and you look at history in that way in the Bible, then you really come to see this, that there is a living history and there is a dead history, right? There's a living and a dead history. There's a living world and a dead world, a fallen world. So what is this dead history, this fallen world? Well, Paul says that this dead world has a root, has a seed, had a start to it. And that this fallen world started from Adam, right? This was the fall of mankind. This, this dead world, this dead history, this sinful history, started from the seed, the root of Adam and the fall of mankind. So how was Adam? Right? What does it talk about in the Bible? Well, it might be a Bible study for another day. Uh, but uh, just to give you a bit of a summary, well, there was a temptation to him in the Garden of Eden right? To uh, eat out of the fruit of the, knowledge, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? We should eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil and be like God. The serpent said to Adam, tempted him like that. And so, you know, you should be like God and you can judge good and evil. So, you know, when we look at the fall of Adam, there was something like this. There was the pride. There was this kind of pride. The pride to be like God. You know, even jealousy, probably against God. Jealousy thinking, you know, God, what do you mean? God can judge good and evil? Why can't I? Can't I be the one to judge good and evil? So there was pride, there was jealousy. This is the disobedience and disbelief of Adam. There was a commandment given. God said, do not eat of that fruit. Right? But he disobeyed the commandment and fell into temptation. Oh, what, what does God want? God didn't want us to, uh, to, you know, to eat of that and to live by our own truth and knowledge of our own judgments of good and evil. He wanted for us to live by his truth, his knowledge, the noble knowledge. God is the one. God is good and God is true. And we should live by his truth and knowledge. Now, who gives us the holy, noble, and good knowledge? There is the 
the tree of knowledge and good and evil, right? So that means there is good knowledge and then there is evil knowledge. So, you know, who gave us the good, noble, and holy knowledge? It is God. God gave us the truth. God gave us the good knowledge, the holy knowledge, to guide us in his love and guide our lives. But what kind of history did Adam start? Oh, Adam thinks, I can, eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge and good of evil, I decide what is good or evil. With my knowledge, right, I decide what is good and evil. But, you know, goodness, we know that goodness all comes from God. So if we're not doing something of God, then the opposite of that is doing evil. So with my knowledge, I'm just creating more evil. And that's what happened to Adam, right? Just more evil and more sin. And with that, he broke off the relationship with God. Adam broke off something he should not have broken off when it comes to that relationship with God. Why? Because when we are broken off from God, we are also broken from eternity. God is eternal, right? We are limited and God is eternal. So when we break off our relationship with God, we are breaking off from his eternity. And the loss of eternity, not having God, not having eternity, that is what true death is. That is death. That is the biblical Christian view of death. It is a loss of our relationship, the loss of eternity with God. God warned Adam, if you eat of the fruit, you will die. But the serpent lied and said, you know, you won't. You're not going to die. But we come to see that we did. Really, we did. Starting with Adam, right? The fallen evil knowledge, right? Temptation and sin entered the world. And not only Adam, but generations were affected by the fall of the one man, Adam. What Paul is saying here in Romans 5 is that all generations were affected. We became slaves to Satan, slaves of sin. And what is the inevitable conclusion of sin? It's judgment. We just talked about it in the last section, right? If there is sin, then the inevitable conclusion for that sin is judgment and death when we cannot bear the punishment. And so when we became a slaves to Satan and sin, we received that inevitability of judgment and death. That's what Apostle Paul is talking about here. And Satan ruled us. Right? We lived in the dead history started by Adam. So from Adam, there was the dead world, right? the world of sin. And we, we lived under the rule of Satan in this endless cycle of sin, judgment, and death. We received condemnation. Satan reigned like a king over us in this world. And, and that's how this world was. And that's the world that we are born to. And John MacArthur, he's a pastor uh, here in California. He likes, I have a quote that I like from him. He says this, when Adam sinned, there was judgment of massive proportions that should settle the issue of how God looks at sin. One sin committed by one couple devastated the entire human race. So really, when Adam sinned, really the one sin committed really devastated an entire human race. Now, you might hear this and you might think, well, how does Adam sin from long ago? How does that affect me today? Right? I mean, he sinned long ago. What does that have to do with me today? How does it affect me today? But it does. You know, it really does. Just look at the world that we live in. Right? From the time of Adam until now, sin just keeps increasing. And we see something about that. That sin, sin isn't just something in myself. Right? Sin is something collective. It doesn't just stay in one person, but it spreads out, right? It spreads out like that. That's always how sin operates. So, you know, with sin, this is what happens. We, with sin, we get fallen into sin, into my power and into my pride, right? And there's people that create even structures of sin, right? Powerful people creating structures of sin, their own way of sin and structures of sin. And then generational sin happens because they pass that structure of sin from their power and pride and authority and greed and envy and jealousy. They create this and then they pass it on to the next generation. And then they pass it on continuously to the next generation and even generations go by. And then we don't even know how it first began. So then that sin hides itself in all of these sin structures And this is why we have fallen culture. In our fallen culture, we don't even know that we're sinning. That's how blind we are to all the sin that is happening around us. 
you know, we think we're living right. We think we're living well. We think we're good people. But then we're living in sin. Right? We're living in sin because we don't even know. Right? We've been influenced by the worldview of a fallen culture, of generational sin, of sin structures that developed over time, that we don't even know that we're sinning. So we need to know that we're limited. We can't see everything. Are we so smart that we can see past these structures of Satan and sin and generations of sin and sin structures? You know, we can't. You know, by our own ability, we're, we're so limited. You know, God even told us what is good and what is bad, but we still sinned. Right? He gave us the law. He told us, he gave us the commandment, but we still sin. And so, you know, we need to know this, that the world we are born into, full of sin structures, collective sin like this, we are helpless in that. Right? That's why the one sin of Adam affects us even now. It means we are helpless in sin. We are totally depraved in a state where we have no chance to avoid sin. There's no way by our own method, by our own power and ability, right? Even the baby biting the mother's breast. We talked about that example a few Bible studies ago. I mean, we have no chance. We just have no chance in order to avoid sin. This is a helpless human condition that we are in. Right? This is what Romans 5 is talking about. This is in a historical framework. We can see this. This is a helpless human condition from the time of Adam in this dead world that we're born into the world of the flesh we're born into. That is the helpless human condition that we're in. We're sinners separated from God, separated from eternity, and our inevitability is death. So, you know, this world, living in this fallen world, right? Living in this evil dead world, what is the problem? Well, the problem started from the fundamental seed of Adam, right? From the fundamental seed of Adam, and then, you know, we came into this world and we were helpless in sin. So we live in that history, the history of flesh, living just for the flesh. And so if that world started from that fundamental seed in Adam, and we lived in that world, and it was the history of flesh and living for the flesh, then the seed needs to change, the root, right? The root needs to change. So, you know, we need to know that our root shouldn't be in this world you know, in the flesh of Adam or root or root is not in the flesh or root isn't because we are descendants of Adam and in our flesh. We need to be saved out of the way of the flesh. We need to be saved from that. And so really, you know, I mean, that's what salvation is. You know, that's why we really need salvation. You know, there's an apologist, Ravi Zacharias. He recently passed away, but he was famous and and also someone that, you know, I really enjoyed listening to while he, was, while he was still alive. He said this. He said, the primary need of the human condition is that we need a savior. Right? Our fundamental condition that we are completely helpless in sin. The primary need we have because we are helpless, the primary need we have is that we need a savior. There's no other way. We couldn't resolve it ourselves. And so... You know, we just, we're stuck living in this world. So as Paul puts it, right, from one seed, Adam, history and death reigned. So we need a new seed, right? We need a new seed for salvation. We need a new seed for history. That is Jesus Christ, who became the new history, new seed, and started a new history of life. He bore the cross for us, and that was complete victory over sin and death. What was before an inevitability of sin and death now became a history of overflowing love, life, and grace. No longer an inevitability of sin and death, but love overflowed instead. And from love, life and grace came. He is our Lord and Savior, and there is no other way back to God. There is no other gospel, no other salvation. Jesus Christ became the new seed. He started a new history, overflowing in love, life, and grace, it became the cosmic victory, right? Before it was this dead world started from Adam, but now it was a new world, right? A new world with a new seed started from Jesus Christ. So, you know, we need to ask ourselves, do we want to be, or are we in the history of the flesh from the world started by Adam? Or are we in the history of the spirit, right? In the world started by Christ. You know, we need to choose, we need to choose the right route, right? 
you know, will I live in the flesh of Adam or will I live in the spirit of Christ? Will I live where evil is just increasing in that world or will I live where grace is increasing? That's what Adam is talking about. Grace increasing. One is evil and sin increasing and just more structures of sin and this fallen world. And the other is more grace, right? More grace increasing. <laughs> this is really, this is wisdom and this is history. This is history's framework. You know, history and the future, when you really look from history's framework, you really see this. History and the future is based on the root, right? The world, right? The two different worlds is based on the root, right? And so history and the future is based on the root that we choose. Right? We were born of, we were flesh, mankind of flesh, right? So we were born in the flesh of Adam. But by receiving Jesus Christ in the spirit, in the heart, or root can be changed, right? It does not have to be the root of the flesh that we were born into. But we can have the root of Christ. By receiving Jesus into our hearts, we are united with Jesus. We accept from him, when we are united with him, we accept from him a new vitality of life and grace from him. Everything of us or future and, this, and the world, that, the kingdom that we wish to live in, all of that is from Jesus. Right? He is the root. Right? We gain all that by him. Right? He is the vine, we are the branches. Right? Jesus even uses that parable, the vine and the branches. All the vitality of life comes from the, the vine, right? It comes from the vine. And we, we are just the branches branching off of that. But, you know, from Jesus, you know, we can, we receive that. We can accept him and we receive him when we receive him in our hearts and in our spirits. So really, I wish we can reflect deeply on the meaning of the cross, really receiving that cross into our hearts. When we know Jesus Christ, his historic and cosmic impact. I like Romans chapter 5, especially the second part, because it gives us that historic framework. We really need to know history well. In the world that we live in, it interprets history for us, the Bible. And when we know history, right, when we know history's framework, then I myself, I can live properly for a new hope in God. I can have a future in the new hope in God. I really wish we can be these ones. So uh, I'll stop there, uh, let you guys reflect on today's Bible study, uh, this final slide. You know, there is this, I, I contrasted two worlds, the fallen world started from Adam with fallen culture, systematic sin, and then the, the new world of Christ, full of overflowing love and grace. Um, through today's message, um, you know, we've been learning a lot of the Lord's personal significance for me. But when we learn this cosmic impact, then we can see even our personal significance even more. So, um, you know, what are your reflections on that? Like the two worlds and the Lord's personal and cosmic significance, uh, if you can reflect on that. Thank you all for your feedback. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, running up on two. So how about we, uh, or I should say four o'clock for you guys. Let's uh, end in a word of, of prayer then. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for your loving grace. Uh, we thank you so much for uh, allowing us to do Bible study today and getting a framework of history, Lord. Lord, the word of God is something that must enter deeply into our hearts, not just our heads, but our hearts. And it is the cross of Jesus that came to us when we were sinners, uh, when we should have taken the punishment ourselves, Lord, you took it for us. And the meaning of the cross enters our hearts in that way. And we understand it in our hearts and and Lord, uh, we wish to come to see that for uh, the world and history until now under Adam, from the root of Adam had been sin and death. And we were inevitably born into that history of flesh, Lord. But in our hearts and our spirits, when we receive you, Lord, we receive a new history of the spirit, Lord. And we thank you for allowing that. And so uh, please uh, guide us um, in this new history. Uh, please uh, allow us to walk firmly with you, be united with you, Lord. Amen. And uh, we wish to really be the ones that um, don't live for the flesh inside of this world, but live for you in spirit. Amen. And we thank you so much, Lord, for your loving grace. And in Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen.